Hello and welcome to my workshop. In the next few episodes, we'll be doing some CNC work with the Snapmaker. I say the next few episodes because when I originally recorded the content for this episode, it became way too big. So I re-recorded everything again and broke it down into smaller chunks. That way you can practice some of the things that I'm showing and also use the comments to ask me questions or provide feedback. If you recall in my last episode, I did two salad servers, which were a great hit by the way, and I did them using my power tools. And when I was doing them, I was thinking, is there a different way to do it? And that's when the idea of using the CNC dawned on me. What we'll be doing is creating this profile here and then finding a way to link it to the overall shape. Of course, I'm gonna be using a scaled down version of it, but if you need something bigger, all you have to do is create a bigger graphic. The steps are pretty much the same. There's two main methods of doing this. One is using your favorite software that can give you a scalable vector graphic or SVG file. And in my case, that's Inkscape. And second is using your favorite CAD software that can give you a stereolithograph file or STL file. I will first focus on using the scalable vector graphic because there are several ways that you can do it. And then I'm gonna move to the STL file. The easiest way to look at it is to imagine that the center of the cutting edge of your bit is going to run along the path. And depending on how the bit is shaped and sized, it will cut from either end of the path. For example, if we take a look at the V carving bit where everything comes to a point, that point is the center of the bit. So unless you are carving really deeply, not too much will be cut from the either end. On the other hand, if you use the flat end mill, we can see that there is a much wider cutting area and that means it will cut a lot more on either end of the path. The easiest way to look at it is with this example. I have created an ellipse that is five centimeters high and three centimeters wide. And I've run two G codes for the two tools that I just mentioned. And this is the result. The one furthest away is done with a flat end mill and we can see that is about 5.3 centimeters in height. On the other hand, if we take a look at the V carving bit, we can see that it's roughly 5.1 centimeters. The reason we need to know this is we need to know where the tool will land. The CNC is going to carve things from the top. So we need to know where the tool will land so that we don't go outside of the contour of our profile and we don't go outside of the contour of our overall shape. It's time to create the graphic now, and for that we will be moving on to Inkscape. At first, we will begin by focusing on creating this profile right here, and then we'll focus on the overall shape and how to link the two together. As I mentioned earlier, the CNC will cut from the top, so we should not be going over our boundaries of the shape and the profile. We are in Inkscape now, and we have to imagine a few things. This particular black rectangle will represent our flat end mill. The white line in the center will represent the center of the bit. This rectangle represents the wood as we see it from the side, and this is our desired profile. We should not be going below the white line. This particular rectangle represents the wood as we're seeing it from the top and the white line represents the outer edges of our shape. Our constraint is not to go outside of that white line. The most difficult part of the manual method is figuring out where the tool would cut, how it would cut, and how deep to cut. So that all boils down to knowing where to place the path and what should be the depth of cut of each path. And by depth of cut, I mean the grayscale. If you're not familiar with the grayscale, I'm going to link my original video on the CNC where I explain what the grayscale is and how to calculate it. Now let's move on to Inkscape. Since we are not to go below the white line and beyond the edge, that means that this part of the tool, this corner of the tool should not be cutting anywhere here or anywhere below here. So that means we can envision that the tool will cut somewhere right there. 
and since we have placed the two we can drag a um, a guideline and place it right at the center and that is going to be our path one and we're going to keep the blue color as the guide now the tool will go eventually to the other side and we need to make sure that when the tool reaches the other side we also do not go beyond our edge marks and coincidentally it's going to be here as well and again we can drag a horizontal line or vertical line I should say that marks the path one on the opposite end next is figuring out where to put the next path and there is no set rule you can do it every millimeter every two millimeters every five millimeters depending on your tool but for the purposes of this example i'm going to be using a tool diameter width and according to the uh, uh, package the tool diameter the flat end mill diameter is 3.175 millimeters so getting back to Inkscape, I am putting a line and the easiest way to change the, the guideline and the location of the guideline is to look at the X value and add 3.175 which is the diameter of our tool. And as we can see the green line has shifted. So our next tool will cut somewhere here. The question now is how deep should it cut? If we make the depth of cut or the grayscale to equal the intersect point between our desired profile and the path, when the tool reaches that distance, this is what happens. And let me blow it up a little bit. That means that this edge of the tool has already cut below our desired profile line. So that means the depth of cut should be above that intersect point so that the edge of the tool cuts along our desired profile. And since we have found it, we can drag a guideline right there. And let me minimize it so that we can see the other end. And what we can do right now is envision how the tool will cut on the opposite end. So this is our depth of cut for our second uh, path. And we want this edge of the tool to cut along our desired profile line. So we can see now that the actual path is not a tool diameter away uh, like in the beginning. And that is because we have a much steeper curve. So we can place this here and christen it path two, give it a new color and click OK. I'm going to continue in a similar fashion until the entire grid is filled and that is going to be on fast forward, but you get the idea of uh, where to place the next path, how deep it should be, and how it's going to reflect on the other end. We have 11 proposed paths that will cut our desired profile and those paths are represented by those vertical lines. The depth of cut of each path is represented by those horizontal lines. Now the flat end mill is not going to do a perfect job and as we can see from the graphic this yellow portion here that is basically wood that is not going to be cut out. So you have to take it to a sander or some other method to reduce the wood and remove the wood so that we follow our desired profile. 
So you can think about it, this is more of a rough cutting as opposed to fine cutting. But don't worry, we're going to fine cutting later in this video series. We are now going to link the paths that we created to our main overall shape. But before we do that, we need to find the depth of cut or the grayscale of each path. And that is easily done by calculating the distance between top of the wood mark or our path one mark and each consecutive guide that we have right here. Uh, the easiest way to do it is when you double click on a particular guide, you get the so-called Y value, which you can take to a spreadsheet like I've done here and do the calculations. So those are all the Y values of each and every consecutive guide that we see right here. And based on the formula, we can calculate the grayscale. So our path one, which is at the very top of the wood, is going to be 255, which is our white color. And the black color, which is going to be our path 11, that is going to have a grayscale zero and everything else is in between. Let's focus on the main shape now. From the previous exercise, we have found the location of path one where the tool is not going to cut beyond our border represented by the white line. And that is done for the left and the right edges, but we haven't done the same thing for the top and bottom. The easiest way to do it is to paste the tool, rotate it 90 degrees, but it against our guide for the top uh, border represented by this black line and drag to the center of the tool. Uh, and we do the same thing for the bottom and that gives us the full location of path one so that the tool doesn't go beyond our edges. What we'll be doing now is creating a series of smaller and smaller concentric circles and the color of each circle is going to be the grayscale that we calculated in the spreadsheet. Let's follow it up with the example. So let's make sure first that our main boundary is a path and that is done by selecting it and going to path and object to path. And now let's copy it and position it so that the edges are in line with our guides for path one. And we can use the handles to do so. And once we have positioned it and we're happy with it, we can go to the fill and stroke and for fill, give the color of complete white. Do the same for the stroke color as well, which is already white. Now let's do the same for path two. We do a uh, copy and paste, and now we have to make sure that the edges of uh, the new uh, oval do not exceed the edges of our path to guidelines. Now we don't have guidelines for the top and bottom edges, so we can be creative and place them wherever we like, as long as they are smaller than our previous path. So I'm gonna position them right here. And now we need to give it a color, and that color is, according to the spreadsheet, 211. So we make sure that both the fill color and the stroke color are the same. And there we are. I'm going to continue in the same fashion for the remainder of the paths and we'll come back and we'll see what we have.
Essentially speaking, we have created topography map of what we are trying to do. And each consecutive circle with its darker color represents a depression or depth. On the other hand, if the colors were going from black to white, we would be creating an elevation or uh, a bulge, if you want to put it that way. Now, aside from the guides for path one that were necessary to prevent us from going over our border right here, we didn't have any guides for the subsequent paths, and that gives us the creative license to put them any place we like. Uh, we can use the handle to drag them and make them smaller and bigger. The one constraint is that the paths should not be going over each other, so we need to have a gradient like we see right here. Or we can play with the node tool to add nodes and add different uh, shapes to those, uh, to those paths. I will be going into more detail about uh, different path shapes in a future video series, but for now let's stick with the concentric circles. The other thing to note is that the further the paths are from each other, the more gradual the slope would be, and the more closer together they are, the steeper the slope would be. And that was verified by our initial path location right here, and we can see the gradual slope here versus the steeper slope there, and the location of each path. And this is the uh, graphic that we need to export to a brand new file and go into the Luban software to generate the G-code. Uh, what we need is this outline border as well as all the concentric circles and none of the rest because if we save it then everything will be executed along with the stuff that we don't need. So. Uh, the one thing that we need is just the border and the concentric circles. I have created two variations and let's quickly go through them. The first one is this. Instead of the two diameter spacing between each path, I have used the two radius spacing between each path. And to get the, our desired profile, we need roughly 20 paths. And again, we see the similar scenario that the gentler the slope is, the further away the paths are spaced, and the steeper the slope is, the closer the paths are. Now, with 20 paths, we have 20 different depths of cut, and the resulting um, graphic looks like this. And obviously, like I mentioned before, we can have creative potential as far as uh, positioning the, um, the concentric circles as long as they follow the same guidelines as before. The other thing to notice is that with more lines, the more accurate our cut would be. For example, when we take a look at the extra material that is left from rough cutting it using the two radius away, it is a lot less than what we originally had right here. The second example is this. Now I have created the site profile as we have already seen in this video, but in addition I have created the front profile. And by front profile I simply mean how we want the salad server to look when you are looking at it from the front. Uh, right now it's a boat shape, but like I said in the future video series we're going to go into more weird shapes. The way to do it is as follows. I began with doing the site profile, located the paths and the depth of cut for each path, much like I showed in this video. And then I moved on to the front profile, and the method is a little bit of a reverse of the site profile. The uh, front profile depth of cuts are represented by the vertical lines, and the spacing between them is exactly the same as the spacing of the site profile depths of cut. Then I butted the appropriate edge of the tool against the intersect point of the depth of cut and the desired front profile. And that ultimately gave me the location of each path. And this is the resulting grid, and I did the topography based on the location of each and every path. If you're a glutton for punishment, you can take the 20 path example and do a front profile for it. Now let's take all three graphics and run them through the CNC. 
I have created a brand new Inkscape file where I pasted all the three graphics. The black rectangle just gives us the contrast and as we see each graphic has the border as well as all the topography within it. Now let me remove that border and when you're creating a file for the Luban software make sure it doesn't have any extra white space and you can easily do so by going to the document properties. In the Luban software import the file and I am going to turn it 90 degrees because I'm going to be doing things sideways and we can pretty much see what each one is. Uh, this one is the manual method, the very first thing that we showed live on the video. This is the one with the 20 paths, so we do see how more refined it is. And this is the one that has the same number of paths as our first example, but it has a separate frontal view and we can see how differently the topography is, especially here for the center. We're doing a relief carving. And when we create a toolpath, I'm going to select a target depth of 7 millimeters, and I'm going to change the tool to the flat end mill, the 3.175 millimeter one. After we generate the G-code, uh, we see that it's going to take about 4 hours to execute, and we have the option to load it to the workspace. And when we click on the play button, we can have an idea of what's going to happen. And this is it. It looks good. The CNC finished and it's now time to do the side by side comparison. We can definitely see a one to one representation, including the minor details such as the oval right here, the small circle here and the big circle right here. And those represent the bottom parts of our graphics. So that's the part here, here, and here. Uh, we do see the more pronounced step pattern in our cases of 11 paths. And the less pronounced step pattern in our 20 path scenario. And let's take a look at some measurements. Uh, the very first grayscale for our first graphic is roughly... 42 and a half millimeters wide and to come up to the actual dimension on the CNC we do need to add the two diameter or the cutting edge diameter to the graphic so we would expect to be at 45.6 or 7 now, if we butt the caliper to this and then towards the very end, we are getting 45.0, so even 45, which is pretty good. There might be some deviation in the tool or the wood. There might be a burr in the wood that I haven't removed that is causing that little deviation. But we see that we are within quite minimal distortion. In our second example, the very first grayscale is right here, uh, not here, right here, and that has 44.8 millimeters wide. Uh, so adding the two diameter, that's going to give us the 47.9-ish uh, millimeters. So adding the two here to the very end right here gives us 47.8 which is again very good and uh, only minor deviation and again that could be caused by a burr or because the calipers are not accurately calibrated and this concludes the manual method of creating the topography in the next video we'll be looking at a functionality within Inkscape if you like this video make sure to like share and subscribe and also hit the notification bell to get notified of my future video releases. Also, follow me on all social media channels and consider supporting me on Patreon. All the links are down in the description.